Hello, everyone, and welcome to Snap Take. This is Glazer of Snap Judgments, the official podcast of Marvel Snap Zone. We've got three brand new decks for you today. We've got a Quake deck and another Quake deck. We've got a top 100 ranked High Evolutionary deck and a secret Lambie deck. We've also got a pro tip and so much more. Make sure you stick around for the whole episode so you don't miss out on massive amounts of content. And that's one of the reasons we'd like to invite you to subscribe to the channel, ring that notification bell, leave a comment, help us grow. We bring you at least three brand new proven decks every single weekday and often on Sundays. These decks come with full guides, shop reviews, bundle reviews. If you're curious about the current bundles, check yesterday's video. Yesterday's video has bundle reviews. We get tips from the best pros, Marvel Snap everything you could need to reach infinite, get high infinite, get your infinity borders and complete your Marvel Snap journey free to you. Help us out. Hit that sub button, like comment. We also gave away a season pass or $10 worth of gold for our friend Father Newman's birthday. Well, bearded Hutch, you won. Shoot us an email. Thanks. Next up, we have Tarot's top 600 quake. Tarot built a quake deck that was iterated upon from rank 73 all the way um, to rank, I believe it was 640 last I saw. It's the 69% win rate deck you've seen. We also usually cover our friend King Koala's Infinite Quake deck. The reason we're covering it a little less formally now is um, Keen hit Infinite with Mobius as a 2-drop, not a 3-drop, and it's sort of important to when the deck is built that Mobius be a 2-drop, not a 3-drop, and I, since that's not the same deck, we're just going to look at it because, look, it's still a good deck. We also have tips to looking at Marvel Snap content, this content, other content, what you can learn from it, the kinds of questions we're getting asked about it. We've got a deck from Carlo. Carlo reached top 100 with a um, high evolutionary deck, a slightly different, not in she not version. So I thought that was worth taking a look at. We've got our pro tip number five. Lambie has a secret Sandman deck that he has only busted out a couple times on stream. So we're going to take a look at that deck. And then we're going to lock at our shop. It's not Peach Moko Day 2 anymore, but whatever. We're going to take a look at our shop. Let's keep going to the first deck. Our first deck is the Rank 600 Quake. It went 66 and 30. That is the 68.5% win rate that you saw in the thumbnail. Um, that's a reasonable enough sample for me to be completely sure this is at least a good deck, if not a complete top of the meta one. But if you play this well, I think this can be top of the meta. So basically you have the scaling power of Nebula and the, uh, so Nebula and Lizard basically tell your opponent to play in a location. Cool. Um, if you storm that location, they're really going to like go all in to try and like win that location as a general rule, right? At that point, you can use Quake and Jeff or uh, Quake and Nico, whatever, Quake and another card or Jean Grey to sort of ruin their lives. Um, that quake will then move that flooded location over elsewhere that you can have claim victory that because you have Captain Marvel, you have Jeff um, to win those lanes. While they are stuck having overcommitted to a lane that your nebula can still grow in, that you can still play something like Spider Woman or Alioth to close out. You could also go with um, that, liz that lizard and nebula thing and then drop Gene elsewhere, forcing them to not be able to compete where they thought they were with that lizard and nebula wasting those other cards you could always go the um nebula early right um into lizard or jeff into um gene into storm into legion and then like your um nebula will grow your jeff will win the game and your legion basically says no thank you and they had to play in that um that stormed lane because you gene there already and then legion closes the game out there's a lot of ways to win this deck is extraordinarily powerful extraordinarily cool it's one of my favorite things to do right now in this nico can be echo nico is often better as echo for this deck um because there's a lot of ongoing in the meta. i don't know if you noticed but be that as it may um if you're seeing a lot of ms marvel still turns out i'm not seeing as much ms marvel, ms. marvel as i was so whatever but like if you still are then dropping echo mid does a lot to make sure your storm stuff works it could also if you don't have echo just be iceman iceman is just a good card that messes opponents curves um jeff can be a nightcrawler you obviously lose a little bit of power from that especially if your opponent also ends up having jeff uh 
sorry, if your opponent ends up having Jeff, it's a little sad. Sorry, I pressed the wrong button there. Uh, if your opponent ends up having Jeff, it's a little sad there. Sorry. Gene is needed, and so is Legion. They're core to the deck. Alioth can be Doom. You lose a bit of power, especially with Gene Gray, but Alioth can be Doom. Uh, this went from rank 73 to rank 639. It's 60 and 30 in the process. So turn one Nibula, turn two Lizard. You can obviously also drop Jeff. Turn three Storm or Gene elsewhere. You Storm right on that Nebula Lizard or you Gene elsewhere. Cool. Because they'll have that lane almost full at that point, and then your Nebula is just going to keep growing, and you can play something big. You're a Spider Roman to win that lane on five. Or Eugene elsewhere saying you have no choice. Now you cannot fill that lane. Good luck. Quake and Jeff next. Or Captain Marvel. Quake and Jeff on top of Gene is quite funny fairly often. Captain Marvel is really good. Don't forget you can also storm there into Legion. Uh, turn five, generally Captain Marvel or Spider Woman. And turn six, Alioth or Spider Woman for the win. I tend to snap on Storm or Gene as a general rule because no one expects Quake. And that's how you steal cubes with this one. Next up, we have, oh, sorry, variants for this one before we go any further. We are, um, I guess we are a three hip deck here. We've got our Jeff, our Legion, or Al uh, Alioth. We've got a Chibi Nebula. I also have the hip. I run it fairly often. I like to switch between the two. This is one of my favorite Chibis in the game. I have this Quake and then like a much more realistic Quake, but this one is showing off the power, so I like it. We've got Midnight Suns Nico, our lovely Midnight Suns Jeans. So we've got a Midnight Suns pair. I thought that this Storm looked better with Quake. Don't know why, but just threw it in there. Um, I decided to run this Spider Woman, the uh, weirdly posed one. This Captain Marvel is not technically mine yet, but it's in the season pass, so I'll get it. And because I'm running the Chibi Nebula, I decided to run the Baby Shang-Chi. And finally, we've got Lizard, one of the last nine cards in the game that I don't have a variant for. But it's coming, just wait for it. All right. I also said we'd take a look at our uh, my friend King Koala's list. I threw Silk in, in the spot that was Agent Coulson. I think this deck takes a hit without Coulson, legitimately, like it's problematic. Um, it's a very similar deck. I threw in some different variants just for, you know, funsies. But basically, the idea is you're using Titania late for that extra power in this. Um, you're not using Lizard. You're basically using Titania instead of Lizard. Feel free to switch back or forth. You've got Shadow King to control your opponent's big stuff and Shang to control your opponent's big stuff and Crossbones to take initiative so that you can ally it as necessary. Meanwhile, Legion opens up the same Storm plays as before and just general location control. And Spider Woman has the same, oh, you tried to pile up on Nebula, now you get to be punished for it. Cool. This is a very cool deck. Um, it's a much controllier version. So if you really enjoy control, try this one. If you want to be more aggressive and annoy your opponent proactively, try this one. All right, channel guide. So Nick W asks, what are the factors for a deck to be considered legit and not just a homebrew? Um, so I think all decks are homebrews. I don't think there's like professional players. I think Lambie is the best player in the world. And if you watch Lambie stream, if you talk to Lambie, he's got all these like homebrews. Almost all of his best decks are homebrews. I think you can start calling a deck beyond a homebrew when it becomes spread out in the meta. But there's only like, I don't know. 10 players whose decks generally get spread all over the meta and everything else is usually fairly self-explanatory. Like who cares who made the first Deadpool destroy? Those cards are like fairly obvious. They're all the cards that just say destroy, right? They're all the cards that just say discard that are in the discard package. And we've sort of like through time narrowed ourselves down into like a, a key version of that. Those are like, you can call it someone's version, but whatever, right? Then there's stuff, um, safety made the first, uh, Dark Hawk deck that was running Black Bolt and Stature, which I think is a really unique build, but that was a homebrew, right? It was a homebrew that became the meta for a while. I think that kind of homebrew that becomes the meta for a while, um, it's cool when it happens, right? But I don't think there's a distinct or clear line. And I think there are just, I mean, I know there are from talking to Glenn. Glenn was on the Snap Chosen's podcast, our podcast, I don't know, a month or so ago. And he outright said there's good decks, right? Like there's good decks out there that the meta doesn't play a lot of, that only certain players play. So I don't think a deck has to be like famous to be legit. Um, but I think that like well-known decks, like if Cozy makes a deck, um, like it's a homebrew, right? But it's a homebrew that the whole meta is going to play. So the problem here is really one of definition, because whether that deck is good or bad, 
no offense to Cozy, but like some of his decks are like everyone else on Earth. Some of his decks are great. And some of his decks are kind of mid, right? Um, but even his mid decks get played more than almost anyone else's because he's the biggest creator in the game. So his homebrew has now become legit. No, it's still a homebrew, right? Like these are all just homebrews. The meta is full of homebrews. Decks only get made fundamentally by someone homebrewing. All of that said, what makes a deck good? That's complicated. Because yesterday's video, I shared a Shuri um, Werewolf by Night Black Knight deck. And I was sure this deck was good. The stats basically suggested this good. It was a reasonably large sample. Played it a little bit because I was like, ooh, Black Knight and Werewolf along with Shuri. That's got to be interesting. So I tried it. Um, the first person, Johannes Khan, says that Black Knight deck is terrible bait. Cool. I shared a reasonably similar deck a couple of weeks ago. Almost every day when I share a deck, I get these two comments. I get that deck is bait. I'm losing with that deck. That deck is not working for me. Why did you post this? This deck is terrible. I just lost 10 ranks. Then I also get something like what jo Joseph uh, Petronico says. I just went from 18K to 11K in about an hour playing it. It's def legit. And I get like eight of those, right? Like, and then I get the like, I hit infinite with it. Oh my God, thank you. Uh, yeah, I get that that happens. What makes one of those decks legit and a homebrew? What makes it work for one player or another? It's all fairly like alchemy, right? So at the end of the day, I think what makes a deck really good is sort of how you play it, right? Does it work for your brain? Um, is this going to work better for you in Conquest than on Ladder? Because for a long time, like, I am so much better with Phoenix Force decks in Conquest than on Ladder. But Spyro climbs to high infinite with them, right? What makes one or the other? You and your brain. Um, every deck is not going to be for everyone. Some decks are going to feel like bad, ill-conceived homebrews to some people. Some people are just going to hit bruns of bad luck and tilt. Some people are going to start playing, immediately start winning, get to their goal, and then never play that deck again, right? Some people are going to take that deck and play it forever, and it's going to be huge. Um, I'll give you an example. So a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, I guess almost exactly two weeks ago now, I shared a deck by this player named Teledadman. Teledadman is a member of the Lambie Discord. Uh, our friend Myth Snap tagged me. and was like, you got to try this deck. This deck is sick. It was during Infinity Conquest. I kept winning Infinity Conquest Borders. So I played the deck. I was like, oh, my God. I shared it. It was in one of my videos a couple of weeks ago. Deck goes unplayed. A few people are like, wow, that deck is really good in the comments. A few people are like, oh, my God, that deck is terrible in the comments. Same as always, right? Cool. Um, four days ago, five days ago, whatever it is, like a few days ago. KM Best comes across the same deck. He's friends with Lambie, eventually gets to him. Um, he does a video on it. Spyro rides it to top 20. They've got like a 70% win rate. Now I've played that deck 15 times. Is that a homebrew? Because Tell a not a content creator, just a cool person, right? Or is that a professional deck? Is that deck trash because a bunch of people lost with it and it was kind of hard to play and figure out? Or is that deck amazing, a 70% win rate, one of the best decks in the game? Unfortunately, all that stuff is eye the beholder. Two pieces of advice specifically for my channel. I purposefully highlight things with small sample size. I recognize that increases the volatility of the decks on this channel. But one of my major goals is because this game has a gambling mechanic in it, if your opponent doesn't know what you do, two things happen. One, when you snap, you get extra equity out of it. Two, they're more likely to stay in to see what happens when they don't know what's going to happen. Which means that you should win more and get more cubes until that deck becomes known. If I wait for a deck to have a larger sample size, you lose that equity. So I'm trying to find the newest and best decks so that you can re reap the benefit of me looking for those. That means sometimes that sample size is a fluke. Far more often than not, that de the decks here are very good to great. There's like, I don't know, I'd say four. Like we do, we use forever. We did 10 decks a week, right? We did 10 to 12 decks a week. I think like five or six of them end up being genuinely great. And the other four end up just pretty good. A, that's a really good, that's a hit, good hit rate. And one or two are, just don't end up working out. But B, like the ones that are just very good end up set, like they still have that really high rate as they settle into that downward spiral, right? Like they start out really high and then people go, oh, well, I know what that does now as they see it. And then it falls down. I'm trying to get you in at that top level where you can take advantage where possible. Finally, as you try playing these decks, please, for the love of God, don't go into ranked or whatever mode you're caring about. Don't go straight into Infinity Conquest. Don't go straight into Gold Conquest. 
play some Proving Grounds, play some Silver Conquest, learn to actually play the deck, learn its lines, pay attention to when you would snap, if you're going to do the snap immediately in Proving Grounds thing, pay attention to when you think you could bait your opponent to snapping, so on and so forth, make sure that you're looking through your plays, you're using the guide, so on, don't, if whatever mode you care about, whatever you're trying to do, don't try and do it with a brand new deck, don't try and do it the second you start picking up a deck, you're going to mess up sometimes when you do that, Get a feel for the deck, say three to five games in Proving Grounds or Silver Conquest. Then take it wherever you want once you have a good feel for it. Also, spoiler, once you get a few games in for it, you're probably going to start winning more with it because you'll know how to play it. Cool. Hopefully that was interesting. Um, that's like a guide to how to use this channel overall, I think. Um, the decks are going to be good. Some are going to be great. One or two are going to be terrible. Sorry, it's going to happen. Sample size is small on purpose. Every deck is not going to be for everyone. Start by playing on Proving Grounds, and I don't think there's a real difference between a homebrew and a legit deck. All right, second deck is the Top 100 Evo. This is really cool. Uh, Rogue is here largely because of Luke Cage, but like also Luke is kind of missing from the meta a lot. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not seeing, like, any Luke anymore. I'm seeing Luke everywhere for a while, and Luke has fundamentally disappeared. So, Rogue's other use is opponent cards like Ms. Marvel or Darkhawk, which you can just take and reap the benefit of. Um, I've got an opponent, Zaboos, that work out really, really nicely. So, what you basically want to do is you want to play the ones for scaling power. You want to use Scorpion, Cy uh, Scorpion Cyclops, and... Um, Scorpion, Cyclops, and third card thing to make your Abomination nice and cheap so that you... Oh, and Spider-Woman to make your Abomination nice and cheap. If you can make it cheap enough, you can play Abomination and Hulk on the last turn. But far more likely, you can play Ms. Marvel as a Doom and Abomination on the last turn, and that tends to win games of... The basic gist here. Ms. Marvel is basically your pseudo-Doom. You can drop her on four, but you'd much rather drop her at the end of the game, either five or six. Uh, Nebula can be armor here if you're lacking Nebula. Ms. Marvel is needed. She's the fake Doom. Um, and it's a high Evo deck, so you should probably have high Evo in it. However, this is a relatively cheap deck, right? Like, if you get high Evo and then just blow the 10 bucks on Ms. Marvel, congrats, you're set. Uh, this is rank 68 in the world right now. Pretty damn good. Um, Nebula is better than Sunspot, and Sunspot's basically equal to Misty. It depends if you think you're going to need initiative on turn 2 or not. Be obviously where you destroy when you're playing any of these cards. If you're not playing destroy, then Nebula is better than Scorpions, better than Sunspots, better than Misty at that point. Um, I like Scorpion a lot on two, straight up. I think it's really powerful and does a lot of damage right now. I watched a few streams earlier today where uh, someone played Scorpion on one side or the other, and it was just like, wow, that's a 2 7 again. Cool. Um, turn three is Cyclops. Generally speaking, that's better than a 2 and a 1, but you don't hate it. Turn four, I will often just drop the thing. You can also still drop Scorpion. You can drop Ms. Marvel if you want to. I would prefer the thing. You can also drop Scorpion on two if you've got uh, Sunspot and Misty out. And Psych um, sorry, Scorpion on three and Cyclops on four. And then you can um, do something like either Spider Woman or Thing on five to get yourself a free Abomination. Which at which point you're doing Hulk or and Ms. Marvel at the end. All good. Next up, we... Oh, variants. Why do I keep forgetting to talk about variants today? It's been an extremely long day. Those of you who don't know, teacher, but I'm also a union VP. How I have time to do this, please don't ask. It's not healthy, but whatever. Uh, I had six union meetings today, so it's been a day. If you're wondering why uh, I've messed up three times now, which is, like, rare. I usually only mess up, you know, two. Okay. Um, I like the variants in this. This is the Twitch Drop Sunspot, the Nebula they gave us in the season pass, just because we did the other two Nebulas earlier. Captain America Misty is my favorite Mist Misty. Venomized Scorpion. Uh, I only do Venomized cards. I don't love them if I have two, but I have Carnage I Spider Woman, so Venomized Scorpion is cool. Cozy Rogue from the Winter thing. Uh, Jim Lee Cyclops, a lovely hip high evolutionary. Thank goodness we have those couple hips, and Nebula would make three in the real version of the deck, because that's the one I play in real games, along with Hit Ms. Marvel. Um, we've got the Max Creaky thing, which is really nice. I like the way it goes with this Hulk a lot, but I also have the um, Alex Horley newer Hulk. I just 
use this one for videos, whatever. And then I have this reasonably cool abomination. I keep putting off buying the hip abomination. Eventually I will. That's this deck. Next up, Marvel Snap Pro Tet number five. If you lose on a 50-50 play or win on a 50-50 play, you should stay in the game of Marvel Snap. If basically the decision is if they play it here, you lose. If they play it here, you win. Or if I play it here, I lose. Or if I play it here, I win. And you know exactly what that kind of thing is because you've seen these decks before, right? Then you should probably stay in. That 50-50 means that you win however many cubes it is half the time. By running, you lose half the cubes, but 100% of the time. Over time, you should stay. Cool. However, if you lose on what you think is a 50-50, but it's an if they draw it, I lose. Like, let's say you know your opponent's running Shang-Chi. That's the easy one. And you're going, not a, um, no Darkhawk involved, because rocks complicate this an awful lot. But if, uh, no rocks, no Thanos. If they draw it, I lose. And you go, well, I can take a 50-50 that they draw it or don't draw it, right? They know the lane to play it. It's not like they have to pick a 50-50 on what lane to play it. They know what lane to play it. So they have a 75% chance of drawing that card in that game. So you should assume if they're staying, they have it. Which means that it's a 75-25 that they drew it, but it's really worse than that, right? Because like if they're staying, they probably have it. That's when you're supposed to run. So a true 50-50, if, if they play it here or I play it here, a different person wins, you stay in every time. With one exception. If you lose, if they have a certain card, you go, if they drew Doom, if they drew Shang, if they drew Eliath, I lose. No matter what, they know exactly where to play it. I cannot beat that card, and I know it's in their deck. You lose, you run away because A, they're staying, so you should assume they have it. And B, it's a 75-25. You've got to um it's a 75% chance they drew it, and that's too much odds you should run. The exception is as follows. In a game of Conquest, when you are favored heavily on a 50-50, you run for fewer cubes because you're heavily favored. So in later games, you will have a greater chance and greater use of those cubes. There's no sense of losing them early. You sacrifice fewer cubes because in the long run, you're more likely to win. Same thing if you are severely unfavored, right? Let's say you're playing the Hella Tribunal deck and you know that you want to drop Hella in that spot on six, but if they have Eliath, you lose. Um, you know that they have multiple answers for you. This is a high cube game. You stay in, as annoying and terrifying as it is, because you're likely to lose that game. So your best chance of actually winning that game is to take a huge amount of cubes on a low roll chance. Cool. That is the exception to Marble Snap Pro Tip 5. Hopefully you find that interesting. Hopefully you use that. I think that that is like extremely important advice that's really worth knowing for high-level Marvel Snap. Our last deck of the day, speaking of high-level Marvel Snap, is Secret Lambie Sandman. He's hanging in his chat yesterday and he just like randomly busted this out. He's like, I played this on stream once and people thought it was fun. It's the highest roll deck. I'm not sure it's good. So he started out going it's fun tier, then he played it for a few games. like, okay, fine. This is good. It's just not like tier one. It's just a good deck. So this is a good deck. It's a basic job. It's got two strategies. It could do the whole Darkhawk thing. Darkhawk thing wins a lot of games in Marvel Snap, as anyone who's played for any amount of time knows. Um, or it can go Psylocke on three into Sandman on four. Or it can, uh, if it doesn't draw Sandman and does draw Iron Lad, it can try and high roll Iron Lad into Sandman. Either one of those, you snap before that play in either case. And when you get that snap off, you probably win. This deck has very weak early gameplay. It's really just Korg, and Korg and Psylocke are weak. It runs Killmonger because when you have to, you can always delete a lot of their early game at that point. Uh, the Darkhawk package is the Darkhawk package. Ms. Marvel and Doom let you go wide. Leader lets you copy their going wide and win the game. You must have Lad, Hawk, and Ms. Marvel. There's just, like, not a choice. Those are important cards. This is High Rule Sandman. Turn one is Korg. Turn two is Psylocke or Jeff. Basically, if you don't have Sandman in hand on turn two and you have Psylocke, you can just Psylocke and drop Ms. Marvel or uh, Ms. Marvel or Darkhawk. If you do have Rock Slide, you can wait one more turn, right? Because you could top deck Sandman. And if you don't, then you just drop Rock Slide. Uh, turn three, Psylocke, if you have Sandman. Uh, or, sorry, or um, 
you can drop Psylocke and Korg, excuse me. Or you can just drop Ms. Marvel if you say locked on two, and Killmonger is very often just a fine old play there. You're behind, they drop some cards, you make them cards be dead. Works. Turn four, Sandman if you can, or Aladdin to Sandman. If not, you're dropping Darkhawk or Ms. Marvel. Turn five, if you still haven't played Sandman and you don't have a better play, just drop them. Sometimes just going Darkhawk or Ms. Marvel, Doom is going to win the game a snap. Don't feel a bad doing that. But Sandman is fine. If Sand is out, also you're dropping Ms. Marvel. And turn six is Doom or Leader. Or Ms. Marvel. It's really nice on turn six, even with Sandman out. You can, on the last turn of the game, go Ms. Marvel and then drop Jeff for, I mean, 18 power on the last turn. So not bad at all. Finally, let's take a quick look at some variants. See, I remember this time. We've got a lovely Korg hip, Jeff hip, Killmonger hip, Ms. Marvel hip, Iron Lad hip, Leader hip, six hip deck. Beautiful. We've got the Peach Psylocke, which I technically don't have, but unless the world falls apart, I will. Um, we've got the Rock, Paper, Scissors Christmas Rock Slide. It's the most wonderful of the year. Like Kelvey's one of my favorite artists. Emperor Ross Doom. Uh, I Hate Sand Sandman. And then I decided to throw this Dark Hawk in, honestly, because I clicked one time too many for the one I like better. But I have this one too, so why the heck not? Shop time. So... I bought the hip gladiator. I know you're all very surprised that I bought a hip variant, but I did. I waited for it, and now it's mine. I bought the hip gladiator. I also bought the noir Howard the Duck. Longtime viewers will know the thing I like as much in Marvel Snap as hips is noir, and that put me under 10 and 9 variants I need in Snap, and that feels real nice. I'm almost done with a variant for every card, at which point I'll get everything gold bordered. Um... And at that point, it's like collecting non-pixels because I've still got like three or four that I have pixels for. Just, yeah, we're set. We're just going to start getting the best splits possible. Um, I don't need that cloak. I have 1602 cloak and Greeky cloak. I have um, Jacinto Venom, and then I have another really good Venom. I don't know what it is, just another good Venom. I have Hit Mordo. I have two really good Mr. Sinisters. I have um, one from a bundle and one from Conquest. I have Hypnic Fury, although let me tell you, Baronic Fury is fantastic and it's a real close by. But the card I'm close to buying is I've always kind of wanted 1602 Enchantress, but I have five Enchantresses. These are the five. I've got the Sylvie Enchantress uh, from the recent bundle. I like it. It's not the same character, but I like it. I've got the I Spend Too Much Money on Marvel Snap Enchantress, which is, again, a nice piece of art. I believe that's Jacinto. Correct me if I'm wrong. A nice little chibi piece. A great Alex Horley. And then I don't actually know who does the uh, one where she's standing on Hulk, the one on your bottom left, but I have it gold. It's one of my favorite variants in the game. It's the one I actually use, although this is one of the cards I'm perfectly happy to use. Four of the five of these don't love the chibi, but the others are all chef's kiss beautiful. That's today's episode. Taking Saturday off, going to rest. Gonna write an article for Marvel Snap Zone. But other than that, gonna actually rest for a little bit. I will be back Sunday with three more decks. You count on. I've got like five. I've got to pick which three. Hit that sub, like, comment, ring that bell so you don't miss it. See you then. Peace.